Okay, so we're ready for the next presentation, Sandbox presentation on meditation for March 4th, 2015. And um, going to stay focusing on the two approaches, one looking at aspects of meditation and just ways of uh, thinking about the action of meditation and what it could be related to. And uh, we'll pick one of the principles and drill down on one of those. The aspect that I thought I would continue with is the conscious and subconscious aspect. We talked a little bit about the fact that during our waking day we are aware of, our, of ourselves. And we call that being conscious. I like to call it being aware or being mindful. You wake up and uh, you start your day and you go to sleep and you end your day. In between, when you fall asleep and when you wake up, there's no sense of self. Then I talked about the subconscious, which uh, many people believe is really the part of you that does all the work. Um, your subconscious is defending you, protecting you, healing you, keeping all of the machinery inside of you working, looking up and down your timeline and responding instantaneously to anything uh, that is important. So up till now we've kind of dealt with two different divisions. Awareness of your conscious self and then your subconscious that uh, is like the iceberg, some uh, part of the iceberg that's under the ocean. I'd like to introduce a third component, and this is just my approach, and other people might divide this up uh, differently, but I see a third aspect or a third component, and I like to call it the unconscious realm. So there's a part of us that we're aware of during our waking day. And there's a part of us that is aware all the time and keeping us functional. And those two aspects are dependent on our uh, five senses plus our ability to process language. And we're limited by the range and ability of those senses. We can only hear so far, we can only hear so many frequencies of sound we can only see so far we can only see a small spectrum of the uh, visible uh, light etc so we're limited physically uh, both consciously and subconsciously but then there's this other aspect that I like to call the unconscious realm and I believe it was uh, Carl Jung that first identified something called synchronicity that this unconscious realm is the end result of everything we've done since we were born. And these are things that we can't be aware of. We uh, just don't have the ability physically to be aware of this realm. Um, sometimes I think of it as a wave that you create through all of your actions that emanates from you. And um, once you uh, created an action, you created a wave, it then leaves you. You no longer can be aware of it, either consciously or subconsciously. It goes beyond your ability. But it still affects you, like the wave that hits a shore and it comes back. There's lots of interesting stories about people who have done things not knowing what the impact will be years and years down the road. I often think of my own life, of the things I studied in my youth, in my 20s and 30s, that have come back and become so important to me now, as I do this work here with uh, Heidi and Charles at the, uh, in, at the Center for the Study of Sport and Health. Was it a coincidence? Was it uh, an accident? Was it, what was it? Synchronicity. But these things that you put in place, these actions you put in place, are part of you. Even though you cannot directly control them, 
uh, they are a direct result of everything you've done in your life. So this unconscious realm is very, very powerful and it reaches out and, and interacts with all other people or things in your, in your world. So I like to, to think of these three pieces that uh, all interact together. Your awareness, day-to-day -day awareness, your subconscious that is always aware and ready to respond, and this unconscious realm that is you, but you don't have direct awareness of it and direct control of it, although it is a direct result of your uh, actions. And if you look back over time, there's all kinds of stories and uh, fables about people making a wish. The, the, uh, the genie in the bottle, the leprechaun at the end of the rainbow, the, the uh, magic that it wishes that you are given and you always notice it always seems to be three wishes and in the in the various stories the basic theme is that it's not what you wish for but it's how you wish for it and uh, there's a number of uh, recent movies that followed that theme where these young kids all wish for things but they they got what they wanted but the way they got it was rather disturbing so there's, there is a way of communicating with your greater self or with your subconscious. And there's a few really simple rules. If you, if you think about it, your awareness, your day-to-day -day awareness is always in contact with your subconscious and your unconscious realm. You're always getting feedback whether or not you choose to, to uh, be aware of it. And there, uh, there is an exercise I've been making reference to that the cleaning the timeline, which uh, relies on the fact that your your subconscious will, in fact, do anything you ask. But what's important is the way that you ask it. So I just want to introduce this concept that when you are communicating with your subconscious, you will always get an answer. It may not be the answer you're expecting. It may not be the answer you want, and you may not choose to listen. And the interesting thing is if you do ask your, your greater self a question, it will keep giving you answers until you say thank you. Until you say, okay, that's enough. It's like a secretary that you ask to go do some research and continues doing the research infinitely uh, forever until you say, oh, oh, that's enough. Fine, thank you. I know Walt Disney did a, a really interesting... Uh, a sequence on that in one of his cartoons about the uh, uh, the sorcerer's apprentice with a young, uh, I think it was Mickey Mouse, starts cleaning and starts getting the broom to clean and the broom started breaking into pieces. There was all these brooms and it was, I think it was bringing water and it just turned into an unbelievable escalation. So that, that was kind of an example of the way the subconscious works. So if, if you're asking your, your subconscious a question, it will keep searching and it will keep looking and it's up to you to say, okay, that is enough. Now there's a way, uh, there's two pieces to this. So one way to ask, uh, one aspect of asking a question of your subconscious is to do it politely and without uh, anxiety, if possible. And there's another aspect of that which I'll get into later, but generally speaking, if you just politely, uh, like when you're doing your fuzzy dot, disconnect from a thought politely. If you just sort of uh, during your contemplation period or during the day, if you uh, want to know something and you don't know the answer, you can ask yourself, uh, your subconscious, geez, how can I do that? Or you can ask your subconscious, uh, you know, what is the best way of proceeding? The, the answers you get back will not be a, uh, a document. They'll be very, very simple answers. And uh, I might mention just at this point, uh, the answers may not come back in words. Words is just one of six ways that we can process information from the subconscious. And, 
It might come back as a visual, it might come back as an auditory, just a sound. It might come back as words. It might come back as a physical feeling. I know some people, when they get answers, they get a taste. They have a taste that says yes or no. So quite often these answers are very simple, uh, yes or no type answers. Sometimes they can be more elaborate. But initially, it's nice to start off with very simple questions and the other aspect of that, uh, so far I said, well, you know, you ask politely, uh, start off with very simple questions. Should I proceed? What is the best way to proceed? And the third thing is try to consider the very first thing that comes back. Don't necessarily have to go along with it. Don't necessarily have to say, okay, that's what it is. But quite often I have found that when you ask the question, you may not get an answer immediately, but if you do, it's typically the right answer or close to. And sometimes if you're not satisfied with that answer, you will wait some time and maybe the next day or after you finish your meditation, uh, you'll start getting more answers. Okay, uh, we'll, um, we'll follow this up with that little uh, meditation exercise we did the last session. But that's, that's basically it for introducing the unconscious realm, that it extends beyond our ability to perceive. Therefore, it is unconscious and we cannot become conscious of it. However, it's a direct reaction to everything we've done. Okay, well, I'll leave that there and we'll do a little exercise uh, related to that later. The principle that I'd like to crunch down on is threshold. To me, threshold really is uh, one of the key ones. It has to do with recognizing when you are not okay. And I've talked with many, many people over the years, and they actually had difficulty, and so did I at one point, recognizing when you weren't okay about something in your day-to-day uh, -day reality. So something you're thinking about or something that you're experiencing, you're not okay, but you still do it. And you still go along and at the end of the day, you may feel really, really uncomfortable because you were not okay. So at that point that you're not okay, you are approaching the threshold. You're approaching uh, your maximum threshold, threshold. I look at the threshold as being like a doorway. And the threshold's um, experience can be uncomfortable. So if you have a situation that you haven't dealt with or you're unable to deal with or that's creating difficulty, going through that threshold, should you choose, is the opportunity to learn. So let me just rephrase that. When you begin to feel not okay, there is probably some kind of learning in that situation. You're approaching a threshold and in some way you uh, are not dealing with it as resourcefully as possible and learning to deal with that situation will be a, an improvement, uh, a, some kind of gaining of information or knowledge. That doesn't mean that, that you have to go along with it. There are many things that uh, I have experienced that I just chose to say, well, I'm not prepared to uh, get involved in that or whatever. You, may, you, you can consciously decide. And one of the criteria I use to decide whether to go through a threshold is whether it's resourceful. Is it really meaningful at this point and, and time in my life to go through this threshold, go through the chaos and the change, you know, just to go through thresholds for the experience? may not be the uh, best approach, but uh, when you do experience a threshold, you have the option to ignore it, to delete it, and to just filter it out. And that's what we normally do. Uh, making the conscious decision, setting down, saying, you know, maybe I have something to learn, something to understand if it's dealing with, say, a family member or a close a friend or, or a, a girlfriend, boyfriend, or say it's a job situation, wh whatever. If it has something to do with your development and growth, 
you may then decide that this is something worth proceeding. So the first step is to just recognize that you don't feel okay. The second step is to decide whether you're going to filter that out and just distract yourself and go on about your day and disconnect from that threshold experience, that uncomfortable experience, because it may not be resourceful. If you say, well, you know, geez, that is important to me, uh, that situation, those people, then you may decide to approach the threshold. And this is very easy to do. Just relax. And um, as you uh, approach the situation, whatever it might be, stay centered and aware. And there are a number of different tools that you can use for that. Talking with friends and family can help you understand but the most important thing is to remain as neutral as possible as you approach a threshold point. And then, of course, and we'll talk about this later, when you do cross the threshold, there will be some period of chaos before the re reorganization. So nothing you can do about that, it's just the way life is. But I did want to point that out today that I think recognizing your threshold, which is, again, really easy. Just recognize when you don't feel okay, so there's something that you're approaching, experiencing. And then making the conscious decision to proceed, expose yourself to that experience or not. And you have that choice. You can filter that out. You can disconnect from any experience you choose to. Selecting the thresholds to, uh, to investigate is really your choice. And, but when you do, there may be some great learnings there. Okay, so we touched on two points. We touched on the unconscious realm and, and how to communicate with uh, your subconscious. And we touched on threshold again. And I think I'll leave it there. And thank you very, very much. And I hope this information gives you something else to think about, some different way of considering what you may be gaining through your meditation practice. Okay, thank you.